Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compel you to never sin. Imam has got the faith for it, but it's the error. But assume, what is Islam, so on and so forth? That's the other discussion. But over here, the Imam comes and asks the, the Imam comes and asks the Imam a very delicate question. A very important question for us to understand how it's here. He says, yes, I think so. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thinks you're infallible. Does he compel you to sin? Does he force you to sin? He says, let me explain it to you. It's like this. He says, come to me in the morning after Salat and Fajr. Come to my door and I will demonstrate toward you the reality of the truth. The next morning, Salat and Fajr is coming. He goes to the house of Imam Ali al Rabba. He knocks the door. The Imam says, come. I begin to walk on the street. And all of a sudden, they pass by a butcher shop. Outside the butcher shop, there's the fat and the, and the extra meat and all of the wastage of the animal that was just slaughtered. And of course, the good meat and the good chicken, and whatever, remained in the shop to be sold. Outside, next to the dumpster, is all of this garbage. Around this is worms crawling and there's flies flying and all of this. That's the garbage. The Imam Ali Salat is still the walking down the street. He says, My friend, he says, Would you ever go and eat from that meat over there, that fat, that stuff that's lying on the side of the street next to the garbage? He says, what that is filled the exchange to substance. Man, whatever eat that. Now, I don't know what but he says, but what does that mean? Before we think about committing any action, we see the reality, we have the insight to understand the result of the performance of such an act. The same way you would never eat that, you would never even look at it, you would never even think about eating it, or approaching it for that matter, is the way that you see the truth. What separates the Mabari of Allah, what separates the Imam that we have to face, what separates the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from everyone else, is the fact that they have been honored, the fact that they have been blessed with the ability to have this type of insight, where they're able to understand reality before reality shows itself. In another instance, in the second one day, in the famous story, many of you must have heard, and one day the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is in the company of his companions and they're walking by the graveyard and so on and so forth. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, let's stop by the graveyard and recite for the first part of us. Walk by it slowly. They all go to recite for the Prophet and we continue the journey. On the way back from the journey, like I said, many of you must have heard the story. On the way back from the journey, they're walking by the graveyard, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tells his companions, quickly, let's walk away very quickly. Let's not stay next to the grave. They say, oh, so what are the way going? He told us, let's walk slowly, let's recite for the Prophet, and so on and so forth. And on the way back, they tell them, let's walk quickly and then get out of the street. Why? He says that right now I'm here in the street because someone is here to punish me. Reach us and to take us to this level, we understand. It's your heart, so it's your good of the This concept of Tahira, this ability to have this insight in the heart, is not limited to the infallible household of the Holy Prophet, but also we, the followers of Jeff and Faith, we human beings, also have to be touched. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran. We did not create man, nor did we create jinn, nor did we create creation, except for the sole purpose of the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the human beings, you and I, every moment of our life, we fulfill our purpose to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is to worship Him, then we also have the potential to reach this truth, to have this characteristic within our hearts, to have the ability to have such insight. The religion of Islam, the word Islam, the Arabic language, is a submission. The Muslim is the one who submits. The human being, according to this verse, 
in that we have to do Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and very clearly explains exactly why he created us. For what? For worship. What flows first to worship? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for this purpose and for this purpose only, that means every single phase and every single facet and every single moment of our life should only be dedicated to this purpose. Towards the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we sleep, we should be sleeping for the purpose of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what you can wake up. You can have the energy to provide for your family, which that in itself is worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that you can go and study, study with people with sincere intention that you're studying for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can also worship and so on and so forth. And when one has this type of a worldview, where every single one of the moments within his life are a means for him to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or every single step that one takes is solely for God, then he has the ability to attain what is known as a person. And when we speak about worship, and when we speak about this particular potential for reaching some great spiritual heights, the question that many might pose is exactly in which way, in what method, in what perspective do you take in terms of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The famous question posed by theologians for the last several, you know, centuries perhaps, is when we go to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are we supposed to, are we supposed to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by fearing this wrath or by hoping that this is not so? The Holy Prophet. He says in the famous narration, La Yakun Mokman Yakun, Hatta Yakun Khaifan Raja. That a believer cannot become a believer unless he has two things. Number one, he's hopeful in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has to spend time, he is fearful. In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What exactly does this mean? Sometimes we talk about fearing Allah. We talk about having hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We throw around these words, but what exactly does this mean? Muhammad is the Imam Sajjad, alayhi salatu wa salam in dua, Abu Hanifa bin Mali. He states, Ilahi, 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 Benefit, what blessing are we worthy of receiving? At the same time, when I'm looking at my sin and I become fearful and I become worried and I become frightened, all of a sudden I begin to reflect upon His mercy. I begin to reflect upon His grace, and it becomes easy to forget that it's not me. A human being has to constantly be within this state of having fear of one's sins or having fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but at the same time hoping, desiring for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Uta, Raghavan, Raja'an, Sa'ifa, Yaman, alayhi salam, says also the dua of the Hamdul Samari. I'm making dua to you in all of these different states when we're praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we're reciting dua to him and all. When we're reciting any of the supplications, we have to be clear that our heart constantly keeps us there. Oh Allah, at one moment I'm fearful. I begin to think about your wrath. And then at the next moment I speak about your mercy and I become hopeful. I say there's no way I lost the time I'm going to punish him. Then at that moment I say, but who am I to speak the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We're constantly in play in between, looking between the mercy and the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let's take a look at this in a little bit of detail before we get into the uh, focus of our discussion. Which is a reflection upon the du'a of Arafah of Imam Hussein bin Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wa salam. When we speak about this concept of fear in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before we speak about this concept of hoping or having hope in His mercy, 
we see that theologians and philosophers have broken it down into three different things. They say number one, thoughts are three different opinions. The first opinion is that the human being should be fearful and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by means of fearing his authority. Would it be, for instance, we're stomach, or we, for instance, yes, we're stomach, for example, to the court. We would become fearful, not fearful with the great fear that we weren't able to sleep the night before, but when you're standing in front of the man in the position of authority, you begin to humble yourself at the very least. For instance, we see that Imam Hassan al he would come toward the messenger and he would stand at the door of the messenger. And he would come down from his horse and his face would turn yellow. They would come toward him and they would say, What messenger is that? Why is your face yellow if you're about to enter it in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He would place his hand and say to his face, The great thing to allow you to ask you to take the door out and give me. And I am your slave and you look toward it and hand to him or others who are posing to this question. And he said, But no, in the presence of the king, I think in the presence of the king of all kings, the master of all masters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the one level, we see that we are fearful toward a particular individual, we are fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the basis of the authority that they have and the fear. A second type of fear, which is perhaps a higher level of fear, the Imam Ibn Abdul also displays, is the fear of one post of the person that they have committed, and in order to humble themselves in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we ourselves, when we look at our sins, then we also become fearful, like we mentioned in the Quran, Ila ra'ayt fi kuruhi, Sajjah. The Quran looks at our sins, and we become fearful. And we look at our sins, and if we read about the hadith, the advices of the Prophet, the advices of the Imam, we, we recite the arath of the whole Quran that says that one who performs this particular action will be X and Y will be punished and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden we become fearful of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, the need for us to slowly get closer and closer to Allah. And the third type of fear that's broken down by theologians, they come forth and they say, the third type of fear is the fear of oneself. And this is the highest form of fearing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It should never think that whatever you have done is your fault. The individual turns out to be the ultimate the bad, ultimate the Quran is the fear. The one who every night performs salat al bayt the one who's constantly seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who, who you look at him and you've never seen him take away the rights of anyone, his family, his spouse, his children, they all love him, they all respect him, and so on and so forth, yet you take a look at this type of individual, and you see that that is constantly uh, seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they think that they're the worst of the creatures. They're constantly humbling themselves in front of Allah. Then, Whatever you have done, is this is the highest form of 
fearing the Bible, the doctrine, the reality of the appeal, the whole self, and the fact of whether or not we are truly reached by responsibility or not. Then we come forward to be reflect upon this whole quote, the value of the mercy of Allah. Of course, we mentioned in the Hadith of the Bible, we were conducting a discussion on how to tell the truth that Allah has done. Believer cannot become a believer unless he is fearful on one page, and on the other flip side, he is also hopeful. Firstly, what exactly is hope? And what is hoping in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We see that hope is a characteristic of the human being can potentially attain and can truly drive him to a wonderful life. The human being hopes in something. We find that oftentimes the hope that we can hope that he has in something will often come into fruition. For example, let me put it in perspective for you. But if someone has been diagnosed with a terminal illness, and today you have been told to go to the doctor, and the doctor tells you that you have this disease, and you only have this many months to live, one group of people immediately will begin to despair. and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, what happens very often is that they passed away even before the time which is expected for them to pass away. But no one else did. We have those who have been come from the real time of the the actual hope, the real ecstasy, to be able to pass away after six months, for instance, and go back and tell them that no way I'm going to stop. Because I have a Lord who is greater than your disease, greater than your medicine. And what happens oftentimes we find that those individuals who have hope and they have a desire to live, oftentimes they're able to overcome all of these types of different trials and tribulations of their life just because of that positive energy that's put out. Hope has the potential to take us to far different heights, heights that truly we are unable to understand at times. Hope is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's also a mercy of quality which allows us to attain a great height in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we come forth to see that these narrations tell us that the mouth of the Epic says that hoping in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reality is a demonstration of one's love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And love itself comes in many different different forms. On one level, for instance, we see that we love someone or we love something because we attain some sort of benefit from them. So I love, you know, my boss because he gives me a really good thing. I love my boss because he gives me a lot of great reputation. You love someone because you attain something from the other. Furthermore, we come forth to see that some people, they only love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course, on a very basic level, on a very basic level of the love of Allah, it's because that they know that they love Allah because Allah, for instance, is going to give them things, he's going to give them life, he's going to give them children, he's going to give them a child, he's going to give them mod- uh, you know, uh, tangible and physical uh, rewards in paradise, for instance, or in heaven, for that matter. So there's a higher form of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Actually, embedded in the human person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates every human being with an innate nature that leads us to one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created every one of us with this ability to know him, with this ability to understand him. And so this brings us to reflect upon the divine, the divine quality and principle of the Hebrew Knights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demonstrates his mercy upon us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all of that which are the culmination of divine quality, but only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the human being naturally inclined towards these qualities, which is why we hope, which is why we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the sake of him, we can be a member to an even higher level of love. For instance, to put it on a human perspective, on the day of Ashura, Amongst the greatest companions of Abiyatullah and Hussein, 
आणि सराची स्वाद गंधान बदले Of 
when Maawiyah ascends the pulpit of the Holy Prophet, the Prophet of Allah, we see that the original Islam had lost its essence. When the leader of Maawiyah comes to the pulpit, the Prophet of Allah, the Prophet of Allah, the Prophet of Allah, the Prophet of Allah, we know that the leader of Islam himself is not living in the distant past. There's something that harms us. Let's just come forth and see the Imam of Sajjah, Imam of Sajjah, and the Khalifa of Sajjah, he tried to present the world of the community a world that will revitalize them and bring them back to our lifetime. Imam of the day, Imam of Sarah, Imam of Sarah, the uprising on the day of Imam of Sarah, the tragedy of Sarah that took place is for one purpose, and that is to be or to resurrect the religion of Islam and bring it back to the forefront and to the hearts of the people. One of those major ones, the steps taken by him, as we mentioned, Imam al-Sajjad, also does the same with the study of Sajjadiyya, is by the recitation of a du'a, like du'a, Yom Number two, we come forth and we see but the du'a of Arafah, many people may come forth and pose the question, and this is a very common question, unfortunately, which really holds no value. But what is the authenticity of du'a Arafah? Without even getting into the details, what are the ulama here? And this is that if the du'a of Prophet Hussein that he recited on the day of Arafah is not from Hussein ibn Ali, then tell me who it was if he's not. Meaning there's absolutely no doubt that it comes only from the tongues of the faith. Who have read that book, have read that publication, we come forth and we see that it's in the same style as Dua Arafah. It is the same style as Dua of a Khalifa. It is the same style as the Dua of Khalifa Sajjah. It is narrated by Isha wa Bashir, the two sons of Ghalib and Asad. And it's narrated in several classical works, amongst them, Ahad Akbar, the Sayyid of the Ba'us, of Shahabus, excuse me, and secondly, by Sheikh al Ali in his work, and Beled al Let's take a look at some of these lines from the Dua of Imam al Hussein, and it's not the Dua of Imam al Hussein. The narration begins and states that Imam al Hussein, Ali Salat al Salam, on the day of Allah, on the night of the Hajjah, and again, all of those of you who have been to Hajj, you will know that this is one of the most important supplications that we recite on that day. It is said that Imam Ali Salam left at the time of Salat al Wah, after he finished Salat al Wah, he left his tent and he went towards the right side of the Mount of Arafah. And then he began to humble himself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he's surrounded by his close family members and his companions. The narrator, Bishop of Bashir, who states, gate, he went to the side of Mount Arafah and he raised his hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to end the Yahudis, he may yet rubu, but Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, he goes towards the mountain and raises his hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Bible can state, as if he was a poor man begging for food, humbling himself in front of Allah. to attain perfection in worship, in walking in the footsteps of Imam al Hussein, is to sit constantly humble in the sight of the Lord. Constantly seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Constantly humbling himself to a lower and lower state of insight, for instance, in the Makkah of Akla, from Imam Zayn al Abidin, Ali Salatu al Salam. Oh Allah, do not raise me amongst the people unless you lower me within my own. In another hadith, he said, Nam Allah Allah is Allah, Sakha, and the one who humbles himself toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises him amongst the people. The most honorable achievement in the history of the Prophet Muhammad. Why? Perhaps because they were the ones who were constantly humbling themselves in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't be ashamed to raise your eyes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and 
middle of the night in the midst of God command, raise your hands as if you were a beggar, as the Mammon Hussein does in the narration of the of the Mammon Hassan or Mammon Hussein, I just said, they narrate that when they saw our grandfather, Mr. Allah, for the law of Harry Wild, he said, Look, I just want to walk around. He was advising his companions and his followers that to even make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when their slippers became wet. Always look to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, now there is states that before Imam al Hussein, he begins to even recite the dua, he stay, uh, the, the narrator states he, that he raised his hands toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that was the screaming, what do you call? Then the Imam alayhi salam begins the dua of Ali Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Alhamdulillah al-Ladhi laysa lakada'ihi da'ana. Wa la lihta'ihi da'ana. Praise it be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has nothing to stop his decree, who nothing hinders what he desires to do. It's important to see that the dua of the Ahl Bayt always begins with the word or with the phrase, Alhamdulillah. All praise and all thanks be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this moment. It should always be in a constant state of thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thankfulness for everything that He has given us. How many of us, on a daily basis, for instance, I would ask, and I would ask myself to this before I remind any of you, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the fact that He has come to save us. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He brought us toward the purchase of His favor. What a, what a great blessing that is. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He blessed us and He thanked Him for His gifts. That we have the sun. For without the sun, we would be cold. Without the sun, we wouldn't have life. Without the sun, we wouldn't have light. Without the sun, we wouldn't have heat. Without the sun, we wouldn't have the process of photosynthesis taking place. Meaning we couldn't eat grass. Meaning that we couldn't benefit from all of the other benefits that derive from the sun. How many of us thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance, for oxygen? That we could have oxygen for, uh, we didn't what would happen. Over to begin any supplication by reciting the prayer of Alhamdulillah. All thanks and all praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the prophet continues. Take the prayer down, take the prayer down. In fact, he's now cut the line down. He says, I'll show you on the next two verses. Wa khalaqtani min al-kharaf, thumma astamtani al-asmaf, amirat wa raid al-bani, wa khilaf al-zuhuri, wa s-sameen, oh Allah, istaja'tani, bi ni'matika qabla. Oh Allah, you began to give me blessings and you began to honor me far before I was even born. Before I was given life. You go, for instance, and you recall that, for instance, when you were having children, that how many people would get to your house to give your gift to your child before your child was even born? How many people came to your parents to give your parents gifts before you were even born? for your house, they pray for a safe delivery, and so on and so forth, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by means of community, by means of individuals, has constantly been blessing us far before we even created. The Imam Ali Salaam is about to continue in the Dua of the Dua. He says, recognize my name, and my name is the perfection and the pride of my being. So again, the Hadith of Allah, the Hadith of Allah, the decrees of bones, and all that. Top of these bones was created flesh to protect my bones and so on and so forth. And you go and you read the Dua of the Muhammad Hussein and he explains to us the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of these blessings that he provided for us even before we even existed. What merciful Lord do we have? Then the Prophet demonstrates to us in the name of the Dua all of the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created and has honored us with before we even became you know, present. Let's take, for instance, for today, we go home and read the Messenger of Allah. And we go home, and we're entering into our front door, and all of a sudden, for instance, we see a briefcase with a million pounds. Get up, your parents, here they are, this is a gift for you. So I go back and I see this briefcase. What's the first question that I'm going to ask? After I pick it up and after I celebrate, after I scream, and after I, you know, perform such a shaker, you know, what's the first thing that I'm going to do? 
Where does this come from? Naturally, the first question that comes to someone's mind when they receive the gift anonymously or when they receive the hate mail anonymously is who is the person who sends it? Yes? I want to kind of have a lot of this because they get the joy to all of these blessings and so on and so forth. But some people, they have absolutely no concept of even thinking or reflecting about where they are. Go on with your day, to just go on with your life, to just getting ready for the next day's run. You have to think that you're like contemplating about where it is. In the same way, when it's out there about like a seat of maybe a dollar for any time or whatever, the first question that I'm going to pose, and the, and the first responsibility of life is to see exactly who gives it to you for what. At the very least, I'm not going to say take your money back, I'm going to say, thank you. At the very least, you need to see what to be thankful when I receive the gift. Thank you for the next few things. At the very least, you need to be thankful. I'm not going to say that, but I can definitely say it. Okay, so I got to say it again. I meant it when I talked about the end of Shay and the next week. Who is bothered to bless me with all of these gifts before it even became something worthy of me? What kind of thing did I put on? I think that's kind of thing that I smell, and so on and so forth. And then the Imam Ali Salatu was salam in this particular line, he said something very important. He provides a response to a very common question that are posed amongst many people today, amongst many young people, amongst many academics, amongst many of those in universities studying philosophy and theology and so on and so forth. And that is, what is the greatest evidence for the proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What is the greatest evidence for the proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If someone comes to me and says, prove to me your Lord, how exactly should I respond? Very common question. We ask ourselves this question. We ask our Allah this question, and so on and so forth. Imam Hussein Ali Salaam Salaam responds to a question in a way that is no longer or ever will be even reflected on. So Imam Hussein Ali Salaam Salaam says, Who is the most forgiving guy in the Ummah of the Rasul? Who is really the most generous? He says, Allah. He said, How can I begin to reflect? Your evidences when I myself am limited. I'm poor in some ways. How can you, who is limited by time, I'm only going to live a couple of days, I'm limited by space, um, I can only grow a certain luck, unfortunately, as much as I wish to be a little bit taller, it's never going to happen. I can only grow, you know, a certain, you know, amount of weight. Human beings were limited in so many different phases, unless I eat a lot, or unless I lose a lot of weight, or so on and so forth. But eventually, naturally, human being is limited to all of these different dimensions and all of these different dynamics. And that's the same thing that I'm saying. So, how can I come forth and try to prove your existence when I myself am limited in this way? And I can't. Can you describe it? Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which I can prove its existence. The only way to prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is if I can prove our own existence. We can identify our own worthiness. And that now becomes the main thing that comes to mind. Father, alayhi salatu wa salam. And he said, Ya Ja'far ibn Muhammad, he's a Bukhar, he doesn't believe in Allah subhanahu He says, Oh Ja'far ibn Muhammad, you speak about your Lord. Tell me, show me your Lord. I want to see it. Imam Salaam 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 Salaam
is more apparent than you that I need to provide evidence to explain to you who is more real you are. I don't have the past, I don't have the past. But if the evidence is that I'm not going to have, I don't agree or they're apparent for anyone who is a person. Show exactly how you are. It's us who are not dead yet. It's us who weren't alive 10, 15, 40, 50, 70 years ago. I'm not going to say how it's for us. We can take you and explain exactly how we came to that Messiah, how we came to that Messiah, how to humble ourselves in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so on and so forth. And we come forth and we see the Imam of the same. Within this dawah, he's constantly humbling himself toward him, and he demonstrates toward us exactly what it means to become amongst those who are the greatest worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he provides us the path to become amongst those who are fearful in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yet at the same time hopeful in his mercy and his love with him who is worthy. is an individual who takes a closer toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He recites in the Quran, or recites in the Quran, but before even we get to that point, many people they come and they pose this question to us as the first of all of them. They say, why do you go and why do you say that they pay off the thing? You go to the post of the Quran and the Quran. Why do you say that they pay off the thing? You should only say that they Why are you saying that they can't pay? I can't pay. He says that the faith of the Islam is someone who is inviting you to work for us. We restate the faith of Allah by the faith of the Jews of Hajj, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has invited us to perform the pilgrimage and the Hajj. So I pose the question that says, why do you take that faith to the same? He says that. In the Tiara, the Nisha 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 Tiara, the then here I am at your service, O oh, the one who comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we were not there with our physical bodies present when you sought our help, and you were and we were not there when you made the call for help, and you were unable to respond to help, turn and our help and say, Here I am, my sight and my body and my everything is sacrificed for you. Why is Muhammad the same alayhi salatu wa salam known as the war, the inheritor of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then he responds, the fear of Allah. And what is the role and what is the responsibility of the 124,000 prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That one is not here. And that was to bring people from darkness into light. That was to bring people from ignorance into knowledge. That was to bring people from shirk and polytheism. Salam, 
is getting the character of the message of all of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he fulfills their call to be the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He does it on the day of Arafah when he explains toward us this du'a. And he does it again on the day of Arafah. He does it again on the day of Arafah. He does it again on the day of Arafah. He does it again on the day of Arafah. Opens up the hearts and the souls of people from that day until this very day, reminding us of everything. Reminding us that everything is focused on Allah. And the day and just before we get there. Which is why, because the Prophet of Sayyid Ali Salaam was not making how to the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we find it in response to that which he states that 100. Twenty-four thousand prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were sent to Mecca to the Prophet. And you, the Prophet Muhammad, the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they seek permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They stand the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They stand the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Moment on that day was a reflection of his love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Imam al Hussein lost Ali al Akbar and he would call out, Sinnah, Ya Bismillah, Ya Bismillah, Ya Bismillah, Ya Bismillah, Ya Bismillah. When Imam al Hussein lost a six month old infant and began to call out, Bismillah, Ya Bismillah, Ya Bismillah, Ya Bismillah, Ya Bismillah, Ya Bismillah. When Imam al Hussein was on the horse in the last moment, he would call out, when he was falling down from the horse and his right cheek hit the ground, he would call out to see that as Every moment on the day of Ashurah, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam alayhi salam had focused his heart and his existence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why this is known as the character of all of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I'll tell you this, my brothers and sisters. I'll tell you this over. That Imam al Hussein alayhi salam alayhi salam it's not only that he was a character of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wa salam, because he carried on their message. The Prophet, the same, alayhi salatu wa salam, was the reflection that he reflected on one day all of the trials and all of the tribulations of the Prophet, which came to pass. We see, for instance, a Prophet Adam, who lost one son. It might have been difficult to even know that son. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him, he was met with another child who would carry on the legacy of prophethood and so on and so forth when he lost one son. But imagine how many sons the Prophet of Hussein alayhi salatu wa salam had. You see, for instance, that Noor, he comes out and he preaches for 900 of his people. They would abuse him, they would say things, they would, they would marginalize him from the community too. Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wa salam was a good prophet. He preaches, he tells them they need to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then what do they do to ignore him? They don't just ignore him, they begin to throw rocks at him. They begin to throw spears at him. They begin to uh, shoot arrows at him. They begin to surround him with swords of the greatest barbarism. Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after destroying the idols, he was placed into the fire. The angels of wind, the angels of rain, they all came toward Ibrahim and they said, Oh, Ibrahim, what can we do to help you as he's being catapulted into that fire? We will just use this fire to support you. Again, he thinks this is an escape, so I tell you what, I'm not trusting, I've been trusting all of my fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Eventually, he finds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the fire exceedingly useful for the messenger. In fact, the manager says something like, Fire was a cool and peaceful to the danger, and the children of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. When Isa alayhi salam, salam alayhi salam, wa ala alayhi salam, wa ala alayhi when Isa alayhi salam was about to become crucified, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him, but on the 10th of Muharram, Imam al Hussein had 30,000 surrounding. It is said that on the 2nd of Muharram, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he reaches 
a thousand vessels, narrations based on the amount of prophetic voice, to stop moving. He could set from the horns to call those in the city. He said, What is the name of this town that I have reached upon? The one who is said, Oh, Allah, he said, No, the Allah, what is it? He just told me another name. He said, that they, they went and they told him, Oh, Allah, the thing is known as the land of God. He said, Oh, Allah, the thing. Uh, he must say, I have to tell you another name that they can set from Torah, the land which is nearby to the river you play to me. And then the Bible of the Faith and Ali was Salaam said, Tell me another name of this land. They said, This is known as the land of Karkala. So they said, The Bible of the Faith and Ali was Salaam, he goes down to the ground, he picks up some soil, he smells it, he says, Surely this is the land of trials and tribulations. It is said that Imam al Hussein Ali was salam. He looks back towards his companions. He looks back towards his family members. And he tells them that this is the region where we need to settle. He begins to pitch their tents. They begin to get prepared on the second or on the third of Muharram. Then Imam al Hussein Ali was salam enters into the tents of Zainab. And he says, Oh, Zainab, let me tell you, come and walk with me. Imam al Hussein Ali was salam begins and says to Zainab, Oh, Zainab, this is the land where our children will be killed. This is the land where our companions will die. This is the place where Al Akbar will be struck. This is the place where the six month old will be struck in my hands and then it is said that Imam al Hussein Ali Salaam walks to a nearby hill and says, Oh Zain of it is as if that I see you on the tenth of Muharram standing on top of this hill as you are watching the mission of the Jewish and sitting on that tent. 